Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity to present our, our work here. Um, as you can see, I've changed the title a little bit. Um, and the title is now not dynamical properties, but the energetics of skirmions. And part of the reason is that um, I realized um, after submitting the abstract that this is a conference or conference series which is very strongly focused on superconductivity. At least it's what it felt like when I looked at the abstracts. And then I was wondering, you know, what might be a good point of contact? Um, since this is really a talk about magnetic materials and a particular type of magnetic structures. And um, uh, uh, one point of contact is just texture formation. So if you take a, a superconductor, uh, and this is uh, magneto-optical imaging of uh, uh, niobium diselenide, um, you can see the vortices in a type two state creeping into the material as the magnetic field is, is increasing. Um, this is like a, let me just briefly start this movie again. This is now one of these materials that we work on, and this is a movie that I got from Takura's group in, um, using a transmission electron microscopy, and as they increase the field, this heli-magnetic material makes a transition, goes into a type of vortex state, and these vortices we call skirmions. And some of the energetics is actually similar, and some of the, the spirit in which these things are being discussed is kind of similar. So that's perhaps like a point of contact between the fields of superconductivity and magnetism, but in a very loose sense. So the expression skirmion actually comes from Tony Skirm, who was a, particle, as a nuclear theoretical physicist, and he proposed the unified field theory for mesons and baryons, basically considering the excitations of pion fields and describing them in terms of nonlinear, like particle-like uh, um, sort of uh, objects. Um, and so he, he considered these very complicated uh, nonlinear terms in his field theories. Um, all of this is basically something in, in three plus one dimensional space, but the way uh, you can think of it is, is a little bit like this hedgehog, right? And it's this topological character. You cannot comb the hedgehog and get rid of this wall, uh, which is interesting to us. So in a sense, like this is sort of like the spin object um, that we're talking about. Um, the expression skirmine is nowadays uh, used in a very generous way for a, a lot of sort of uh, spin textures. Um, so there is a large zoology of magnetic skirmion materials um, in which these types of objects are being observed. This is just sort of an incomplete list, uh, which I would like to cover in the next couple of slides in order to motivate what is the focus of the presentation today. Um, so the first systems where we discovered them was this class of B20 compounds. MNSI was the first one, but we then soon realized that in this uh, iron cobalt silicon, um, the phase diagram also uh, looks such that uh, when you cool down, you come from a paramagnetic state, you get a small th a skirmion pocket, right, close to the paramagnetic to helimagnetic phase boundary. So this is field and this is temperature, and these are different temperature and field histories. Soon after that, um, imaging using this transition, so we used neutron scattering, uh, imaging with uh, transmission electron microscopy succeeded, and even individual skirmions were seen. When you take now this entire series of compounds, Whenever there was like heliomagnetic order, right, um, uh, these, uh, these skirmions seem to be uh, about. This is not just happening at low temperatures. Um, it happens in, uh, at, at high temperatures. It's now been seen also like all the way up to four, 500 Kelvin in different materials. It's a very generic phenomenon. Um, it happens in metal, metallic systems. These are doped semiconductors, um, but also like in insulators. And in fact, I will be focusing on this particular compound, which has the same space group than these B20 compounds. So we'll say more about this in a second. Now, starting from this, um, there's now a large class, a large classes of materials where um, these skirmionic states are being discussed. These are uh, perovskites uh, with a small phase pocket. Um, these are these barium ferrites. Um, they look like bubble materials, um, and uh, there seem to be topological charge associated with that. Um, here are the lacuna spinels, which are anisotropic. So this was cubic materials that I showed in the beginning. Right. And um, there is a Bloch type and nail type skirmions being identified in here. And they're even more complicated textures. Um, in this manganese germanium, which is the one out in this B20 series, there seems to be a three-dimensional type of uh, texture formation. Right. And most recently, in the Häusler compound, something called anti-skirmions has to do with the winding. Topological winding has been reported. So this generated a lot of interest, um, uh, also like in the spintronics community. And one of the big questions in this field is, um, where do you find these phases? How are they stabilized? That's the energetics that I want to talk about. 
right? What are the stabilization mechanisms? One of the big questions is, okay, we always see like one phase pocket, one particular regime in temperature and field where these phases show up, right? But there may be different mechanisms basically stabilizing the skirm. And so in principle, in one material, you could have also like two separate phase pockets driven by completely separate mechanisms. That's one part of the story that I talk about today. The second part is that, of course, it's nice to have this in a bulk material, but when you think of applications, you want to have it in a film-film system, right? And sure enough, right, the first approach would be to make thin films of these particular materials. So there is some uh, very nice uh, seminal work on like iron germanium, where this was inferred from transport measurements. Um, uh, there are studies on this MNSI compound, right? However, there are conflicting phase diagrams. It's not quite clear exactly what is the energetics going into this and do we really understand what's happening there? And that's also something that I want to talk about in this uh, presentation. I don't want to forget before turning to the main part of my talk, to mention that um, uh, there are also like these uh, single atomic layers. Um, for instance, uh, uh, iron on uh, tungsten, or this is palladium iron on iridium substrate, uh, where skirmions are uh, stabilized here by virtue of an induced um, uh, uh, gilachinsky maria interaction. And um, uh, several groups have also now um, achieved to uh, get skirmions in uh, uh, multi-layer system, so starting from bubble materials to engineer Gilchinsky Maria interactions into these systems and basically get these types of textures. Um, so this is just from some recent work from the group in Paris um, um, with Albert Fair, and this is uh, work uh, carried out in the States in Alex Hoffman's group. Now, the main message of my talk today is that I want to tell you something about one of the bulk materials. It's an insulator, this copper selenate, and there are two parts. The first is that we studied using resonant elastic um, X-ray scattering the evolution of the skirmion properties as we go from a polished surface into the bulk. So we, what we wanted to know is, is what does the evolution look like and what's the effect of the surface on the skirmion winding? And the way you can think about the underlying question is, is that simply there is an asymmetry here. So you get asymmetry induced uh, interactions, one possibility, but also like there's each um, uh, moment in the material has a partner. So if you look deep in the bulk, obviously like you're symmetrically surrounded by partners with which you interact, but the surface is also like lacking this partner. And it turns out that actually there is some nail winding on the surface, right? And it turns into bloch winding in the, in the, deep in the material. And the surprising thing we found in these studies is that actually the nail twisting extends much, much deeper into the material than was anticipated. So the surface plays a, a much more important role than we can currently account for in terms of theory. And that has deep implications also for the thin film systems. Um, the other experiments we've done is with neutron scattering to start with that we explored this phase diagram for this compound. And it was very well known that there's a small phase pocket out here. However, what we discovered, there's a second skirmion phase pocket down there. And they're stabilized by completely different mechanisms. This is basically order by disorder, and this is by magnetic anisotropy. So this only shows up for the one or direction. Okay, now here's what I wanted to do. This is the outline after this general motivation and a brief recap of the main messages. I just want to say a little bit more about the skirmine lattices in these cubic chiral magnets, because these are the model systems that we work on. And then I want to talk about these two types of experiments, the depth-dependent X-ray tomography on the one hand, which tells us about the surface, the importance of the surface in a very controlled way, and about the observation of two independent skirmion phases in the same material, right, as a manifestation of two stabilization mechanisms that are in, uh, separate, uh, uh, different in the same material. Here's my list of collaborators in Munich. Um, it's Alfonso Schacken and uh, Marco Halder, who mostly worked on these two independent uh, phases with the neutron scattering with Sebastian Mühlbauer. Um, and uh, in Oxford, uh, the work um, uh, on the X-ray scattering was mostly done by Sheila Sang and uh, Thorsten Hesida with uh, strong support from Gary van der Laan. The theory um, is basically done in, uh, in collaboration with uh, Achim Rosch's group and Markus Gast in Dresden, and the samples uh, came from uh, Helmut Berger in Lausanne. Okay, so on skirmion lattices in cubic chiral magnets, I mentioned this in the introduction. I want to say a little bit more, and I want to touch also again on this analogy with superconductors. 
And uh, I want to remind you what we typically see in a ferromagnetic material is a hysteresis loop, in a hysteresis loop is the formation of magnetic domains. All right? um, so really the driver here is, is a combination of anisotropy energy and the reduction of the dipolar stray field that drives this, sort of generates these, uh, these, uh, these textures. Um, there are different types of domain balls. So the twisting from going from one to the other, it could be like either a Bloch type of twisting where you have sort of like a helical mo motion or a, a nail type of twisting where you have a um, cycloidal um, motion. In any case, the width of this domain wall uh, is the result of the competition between the anisotropy uh, and the exchange interaction. Now you can ask, can I basically reduce this domain wall energy by adding an internal twisting mechanism, and that is something that is provided by this Chiyoda-Chinsky Maria interaction. If you have a material that basically wants to twist, right, you can benefit from this, and you can reach a situation where the system essentially wants to develop as much domain wall, so to speak, um, as possible. And that's the point of contact with type two superconductivity, if you wish. Right. And so the materials to look at um, are these B20 compounds. They have a hierarchy of energy scale, so the cubic crystal structure. Right, they have strong uh, ferromagnetic exchange couplings. They have an isotropic Gielichinsky Maria interaction, um, uh, generating a twisting, sort of perpendicular arrangement of the spins with a particular handedness. And then you have very weak um, uh, magnetic anisotropy terms, like the typical cubic anisotropies and gradient terms that give the direction for this modulation. So it's essentially a ferromagnetic state with a very long wavelength helical modulation along a particular direction determined by these crystal field terms. Okay, now in the experiments, this is what I showed you already in this movie. What we do is neutron scattering. You can basically image uh, um, this, uh, this emergence or appearance of, these, uh, of this uh, vortex type of structure right, with small angle scattering and you get a typical diffraction pattern which looks like this. Um, and so uh, the phase diagram that we first observed was that basically in this compound here, MNSI, when you go from a paramagnetic state to uh, low temperatures at 30 Kelvin, you get heli-magnetic order and under a small applied field, you get this tiny little pocket where you have this type of structure. And we call this a skirmin lattice because when you analyze the topological winding with this expression here, so N is just basically keeping track of the orientation of the moments, you find that each magnetic unit cell carries a finite topological winding number. Uh, and that, that's the point of contact with, with Skirm's idea that this is an order, a lattice order, where each um, magnetic unit cell carries a topological winding number. This also generated a lot of interest because when you let currents flow through the structure, they start to float, right? And I don't have time to cover any of this work, but the surprising thing was that the current densities at which this happens are six orders of magnitude smaller than what is usually done in the spintronics community, so it seems to be amenable to spintronics applications. It just generated a lot of interest. Okay, now let's look at the energy scales. I mentioned there is this ferromagnetic exchange, right? So this is this hierarchy. Then we have the chilchinsky maria interactions. And then there are all sorts of anisotropy terms. And what you have to do is, is you have to just look at the symmetry of your crystal lattice and then just figure out which of these terms are allowed and which are not allowed. And one of the questions that we wanted to know in the beginning is, is how does this actually respond, this, top, this uh, helical winding, to these particular terms here? So one ex simple experiment one can do is look at a spherical sample, right? And then for different orientations of the single crystal sample, measure across the phase diagram. And the first thing to do would be deep below the skirmion phase. So look at this helical to conical transition. It's essentially a spin flop transition and map this out. So this is just data here in the magnetization and the susceptibility. We've also done this in neutron scattering. And the upshot of this is that it really depends on in which direction you look. Right? You can get crossover behavior, or you can get, very interestingly, icing type of transitions with like uh, set two or set four uh, symmetry. This is really the domain populations. What is interesting is, is that these helices, basically the, the modulation itself, doesn't respond to this um, anisotropy term. So the anisotropies are so weak, right, that all you do is, is you rigidly move this modulation back and forth. You can do the same thing for the skirmion lattice, right? Um, so these are the terms that we considered here. And what we did is, is we mapped out the precise orientation of the skirmion lattice in response, right, to the underlying very weak 
um, uh, crystalline uh, anisotropies, right? And what we find is, is there's a small reorientation. If you change around this basically spherical sample, it reorients by 15 degrees if you've applied the field along a 100 direction. And there's a small meandering, a back and forth tilting by one or two degrees, which we can account for by six order terms. But the skirmish lattice as such is rigid, right? It's basically like a triple Q state, which very rigidly is almost perpendicular to the field. And the, the slight misalignment is just the result of these anisotropy terms. So we thought this is a meandering that we see just by a few degrees. Basically, this is the, explains the, when we rotate this angle here, right, um, the changes of intensities that you see in this case. Okay, so the state of affairs was that we thought, okay, this is all extremely well understood. We have a generic phase diagram for these cubic systems. We really understand the energy scales up to six order and spin orbit coupling all this well, right, and then, uh, along came the idea, okay, you have to understand what the surfaces do because the phase diagrams in the fin film systems are not well understood. And the idea is that we would really like to know how the magnetic structure develops into the surface in a bulk material because if you make thin films, you always have the problem there is interactions with like the substrate, you may have strain, right, and so forth. So this was the set of phase diagrams that we had, right, and here it turns out that actually in order to track that, um, Neutron scattering um, is nice in the bulk materials, but X-ray scattering is actually an extremely powerful probe. So this is re uh, resonant elastic X-ray scattering. These experiments, these, these experiments were done at uh, Diamond, um, as I said, by, by Shilai, Torsten, and Garrett. Um, and uh, there were other groups in the world um, who did at the same time also this, these types of experiments. And you can see, um, uh, this is now scattering in the copper L3 edge, I think, um, uh, that you get essentially the same type of diffraction pattern. Right? We reproduce this um, also like with magnetic force microscopy. You can map out the magnetic domains. What is very nice about um, uh, Rex is that you can also exploit the circular dichroism in the Rex. Um, and you can basically then keep track of the polarity, that's like the orientation of the spins, the chirality or the helicity, basically the type of winding, whether you have a Bloch or a Neal type of winding. Right? So what it looks like in the experiments is, is that your diffraction pattern basically develops an extinction line, and that extinction line tells you precisely what type of uh, uh, twisting you really have. So if you have a nail type of twisting, the extinction line would be like this, and then depending on whether you have like a positive or a negative handedness, a left or right handed, right, you could have two types of different Bloch states, Right, and then uh, this is sort of like the opposite polarity uh, for this nail state. So this is just a map basically um, illustrating the potential right, of um, Rex in these studies. Um, along the same lines, uh, recently work has been done on thin films to map out like in thin film systems, uh, the difference between nail and Bloch walls right, um, as a function of thickness. I'd just like to mention this in passing. Okay, so now on the energy dependence of Rex, what um, uh, Garrett and Torsten and Schiele did is, is they uh, basically varied the energy very slightly, right, and uh, thereby could vary the penetration of the um, photons into the sample, and then it's a kind of tricky to, to backfold basically the information that you get because, of course, the, uh, the intensity pattern that you receive is the result of, like, photons scattered in various different depths, but what they see is that they get a well-defined extinction line at all energies. And that's already a very important piece of evidence saying that, you know, there is a, 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 a controlled um, twisting, a, a very simple sort of situation giving rise to the scattering. So um, this is just a simulation showing that one can reproduce these scattering patterns for different types of helicity angles. Right. And then doing this, what they did is, is they calculated the depth dependence of the helicity angle. The helicity angle tells you whether you have Bloch or nail twisting. Okay, and the story is that what they find is at the surface 100% nail state and deep in the material 100% block type of twisting. The block type of twisting was expected. The nail type of twisting is what you expect from the surface. Um, Jan Müller, Lukas Heinen and, and, uh, uh, and Achim Roche and, and, and Markus in Dresden did some calculations, Monte Carlo simulations to find out whether this is quantitatively consistent with the energy scales that we have from other, from, that we know about the, these materials, right? 
And the surprising thing is, is if they basically just let the surface float freely, the nail twisting is expected to be much weaker than was exper uh, experimentally. But what you could do is then just force the surface to have 100% nail twisting, right? Um, and then they look basically at how does this uh, nail twisting relax into the bulk. And this is just a consequence of basically next neighbor interaction. So it's a distortion, right? And this perturbation propagates. So it's immediately related essentially to the wavelength of the of the, uh, um, the helical state, which you see in the same experiment, right? So what you expect is a decay, right, as indicated here of about nine uh, nanometers. But what you see experimentally, so this is the same line here now plotted on this logarithmic scale, uh, is an order of magnitude deeper, which basically means there must be some very soft mode on the surface, somehow coupling and helping this nail state to relax much slower than expected from the interactions that we see in all of the other scales. So this, the point is this, we have some kind of contradiction. We don't understand precisely what the surfaces do, and I think this is very important for understanding and designing thin film materials. Okay, so this is a summary of this part of the talk, and I think I probably have, perhaps that. Okay, so I think that would be okay for the, the second half. Um, so going from the surface into the bulk, Right, what we find is a change from this uh, perfect uh, nail twisting to a uh, perfect uh, uh, block twisting, but on a scale which is at least an order of magnitude too large. Um, okay, now um, on to another facet of these energetics of these materials, and that has to do with these phase diagrams and having different pockets. And I, the, st the starting point for this part of the study was that we early on had found metastable squamous lattices in this particular series. It's disordered, and the disorder helps when you do field cooling. So you basically just apply a field and cool from the paramagnetic state through this material, and then you can get at low temperatures right, uh, the squamous lattice in a, in a sense like in a supercooled or like kinetically arrested state. And that helped us to understand and study the decay mechanisms of the skirmions. It's topologically distinct, and one asks, well, how does this decay? What is the underlying microscopic mechanism? So we did MFM measurements, and more recently, uh, Lorentz stem measurements, where we studied and found that there are different decay routes. One of the things that was surprising in the system here, and that had been seen beforehand, is that there is some kind of weird dissipation at the boundary between the conical state here, so this pocket had been seen before in neutron scattering in Temon, what have you, but it was not clear what was going on here. And mapping this out very carefully, right, what we found is that apart from this usual phase diagram where we have these types of scattering distributions in neutron scattering, when we apply the field not along a 111 axis, but a 100 axis, and we're careful about the temperature and field history, there are two further phases down here. Right. And it's very hysteretic, right? and so one has to be very careful about these experiments. And we've done this now with different types of quantities. So this is the neutron scattering, which is summarized here. What we find is, is that, first of all, this conical state, which is the spin flop state, for some reason suddenly decides it no longer wants to stay along the field, but tilts away. Right? But this only happens for the cubic 100 axis. And then somewhat later, suddenly a scattering intensity shows up perpendicular to the field, which in the first experiments, what we found is a ring of scattering. We could later show that this is really the six-fold scattering pattern. So in a sense, energetically, what happens is we first go into this tilted state, right? And then in the second step, we end up in this new phase, which is, turns out to be a low-temperature skirmion phase, right? And then eventually that survives, right? So it really depends on the type of histories. So this is zero field cooled going up in field and then doing a temperature sweep up, or this is something we call high field cooled. We go down reduce the field, and then go up, right? And the gray and red shading basically uh, show the uh, areas where we find these phases. So these are typical data. This is again done on a spherical sample to get rid of a distribution of the internal fields. So they're nicely homogeneous because we found as the skirmions respond so sensitively to an, the orientation of the applied field that we have to be very careful. Otherwise, basically, you get a mess with the diffraction patterns. Right, so this is for the high field cool state, just to show that we've done this in two scattering configurations um, to make sure right, um, that, uh, that we, perhaps this one's working. Okay, great. Um, to, to get a complete understanding. So what we, we mapped out in more detail then um, was basically the field dependence of the modulation length, right, which was uh, varying very strongly. Right, and we, uh, 
It, and then this is like the tilting angle. So we have a conical state, we go in the spin flop state, and suddenly we reach a threshold and then this thing just goes away. But it somehow energetically no longer likes this. Um, our first exercise was to really show that this ring of scattering perpendicular to the applied field indeed is a skirmion phase. And so there's a trick one plays and takes from superconductivity when you study a superconducting vortex lattices, and that's basically a type of pumping. So going into this intermediate field range, then basically cycling back and forth, uh, one can increase the intensity of the skirmion phase. And doing that, and then tilting the field slightly away, one goes from a ring to the six-fold scattering pattern. And it turns out it's the in-plane component of the field which breaks the symmetry, which helps us then basically to populate the domain such that we see it's a scattering pattern. So, two more slides, or three more slides for the explanation. I've shown you this before for the energy scales, and I said that this is very weak and doesn't play a very important role. Um, for copper selenate, it's a little bit stronger than for MNSI or iron cobalt silicon. And it turns out that this particular term here, which is the standard cubic anisotropy term that you know from all ferromagnets, it's been known since, you know, uh, mankind's been around on this planet, um, uh, that's the key player here. It helps us in the following way, right? Um, and this is an illustration just to understand a little bit the gist of it. Um, what we have is a modulated structure which sees which keeps its modulation, its periodicity, but it lifts basically in an anisotropy potential um, that we know from a ferromagnet. So as we increase the field and this conical phase closes a little bit, the spins start to explore four particular field directions, right, uh, areas which are energetically unfavorable. And so essentially what we get is, a, as a function of field, a change that looks like a change of the easy axis. Right, so we increase, it folds in, and then suddenly goes, oh no, I don't like that, and it tilts away. And that's what we need. Then we can also stabilize a multi q state perpendicular to the field. Right? And that's something that uh, uh, Lucas and, uh, and uh, Achim and Markus have calculated. This is in Monte Carlo simulation, a phase diagram showing that this term alone is sufficient to get the skirmion phase. So we get the tilted conical phase as a metastable state, and then you basically end up in this... Uh, uh, in the skirmion lattice, it turns out that there is two types of uh, morphologies possible, a square and a triangular lattice, and we may see experimentally also the square lattices is more difficult to distinguish. Um, last slide. Of course, we've seen the signature after we knew what was going on also in thermodynamic properties. But one has to be very careful with these measurements. So demagnetizing effects, the sample shape, et cetera, et cetera, are very important. Right, so this is a comparison now between the neutron scattering up here with the uh, measurements of the magnetization, and there are tiny features telling us these are thermodynamic phases. Here's the message of my talk again. This is depth dependence and the importance of the surface on the one hand, and uh, the observation of two skirmion phases. We're not aware of any other material where this has been identified, but I think what it shows us is that if you increase the anisotropies just a tiny, tiny little bit, right, hell is kicked loose, um, and then suddenly you get a much richer phase diagram. So in the zoology of skirmion phases, I think we have to revise this as my last slide, or we end up like with these mythical pictures, uh, pictures from, from uh, uh, Greek mythology where you have all sorts of different uh, uh, characters to these phases. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful nice talk.